Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who knows folks in Liverpool as well as in Bombay. Ladies and gents, the captain. Yes, cheers, mates. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Snake Oil by the good folks over at Homestead Beer Company out of Heath, Ohio, and they have a great location with taps and food up in Delaware, Ohio. Snake Oil is just one of many of Homestead's beers, but it is my current favorite from Homestead. This is a pale ale, 7.5% ABV garage grade four out of five bottle caps, and here are some of my current favorite people here in the garage. First up, a cheers to Kelsey. In Castle Rock, Colorado. And a big cheers to Christine in La Mirada, California. Here's a cheers to Alana B. in New York, New York. And a big cheers to Veronica in Topeka, Kansas. Here's a shout out to Catherine in Peoria, Arizona. And last but certainly not least, we have Charity in Gilbertville, Iowa. Everyone we just mentioned and butchered the cities that they live in. They went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer funding for that. Big hugs. Big hugs. That's why they call us the butchers of true crime. Chop, chop. <laughs> Thanks for filling up the fridge. B W E W R U N Beer Run. Make sure you go to our website and sign up on our mailing list because we, we tell you about discounts to our store page. And we got some new shirts in the store, so check those out at truecrimegarage.com. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Boardman, Ohio. In 1970, the suburb of Youngstown had a population of about 30,000 people, and that population would grow to almost 40,000 by 1980. In the early 70s, Boardman experienced what fortunately most cities and towns of its size rarely, if ever, experience. The homicides of three youths. The victimology was similar. Three boys, similar in age, ranging from 12 to 15 all from similar neighborhoods and backgrounds. And all three abducted or attacked while walking home as the sun was going down or shortly after. All three cases are still unsolved. Two cases are considered to be very much cold cases. The leads have seemingly dried up over the decades. Anything left open-ended, it appears those options have only been left that way because they were looked at, explored, and examined. And there either is likely one, if not two, results. Either no evidence to back the theory, or we just can't put someone where they would need to be to have committed the murder or murders. However, one of the cases is still very warm. And as we hinted at last week, One of the cases may be getting warmer as we speak. 15-year-old Thomas Baird was the first of three victims. He was attacked on his way home and later succumbed to his injuries in December of 1970. He was found by a police officer, having been badly beaten by an unknown assailant. Thomas was placed in intensive care, where sadly he passes away days later never regaining consciousness. Police were never able to question him about the attack that led to his death. 
Brad Bellino, age 12, was abducted on the last day of March, 1972. And he was killed after leaving his friend's house. His body was not found until April 4th, when a refuse collector spotted his feet sticking up in the trash in a collection bin behind some businesses in a busy section of Boardman. The third Boardman boy victim is 13-year-old David Evans, who goes missing on Friday, January 17, 1975. All signs point toward abduction. His hat was found trampled in the snow at an intersection in his neighborhood just blocks from his home. His lifeless body was found near an office building. His little body frozen stiff. Sadly, the boy died from his diabetes. He was abducted and held somewhere and denied his much-needed insulin shots. Regardless of how he died or the coroner's ruling, he was murdered. He was abducted and then died from disease as his captor denied him treatment. And then, his body was dumped. Of course, the good people of Boardman could not help but think that these three murders may be connected, maybe even committed by the same person or persons. In fact, even now, 50 years later, the case that is still showing promise of likely being solved, the Brad Bellino case, Detectives have openly suggested that a break or an arrest in that case may lead to much needed information in one, if not both, of the other homicides. In early February of 1975, just a little over a week after the Evans boy's body was found, the Boardman Chief of Police received a letter mailed from the greater Youngstown area. It was double stamped with the word important on the front of the envelope. The single page handwritten letter reads, to whom it may concern. Please don't let that man out of jail and Struthers as he is the one responsible for three boys deaths. The one that was found along a street, that Bellino boy and Evans boy. That 11-year-old girl would have been dead by now if he had gotten away with it. Mr. As you know, one makes just one wrong move and gets caught. These kind of men must be kept out of circulation. Now, I cannot tell you who I am, as I want to keep on living. Someone would kill me. But if he is found guilty, I will talk to someone and tell you how I know. It may even come as a shock, and I know you won't want to believe me. The letter is signed, Please Help Save the Children. This is True Crime Garage. Well, it's been 50 years, Captain, since the murder of Brad Bellino, and we discussed in the trailer the other homicides that were going on in Boardman, Ohio, around the same time. We have three homicides, Thomas Baird, Brad Bellino, and then David Evans. And I know there's some debate out there. Was the Evans case truly a homicide? I'm giving it the old colonel opinion here, and I know that the captain shares my opinion in this. You abduct a child, and you deny him his much needed medicine for his disease and then later dumped the body. Yeah, that's uh, looking like a murder to me. So regardless of what the coroner's findings were or how the case would move forward based off of the coroner's findings, what we do have, and we discussed this last week was the police saying, look, we have a situation with David Evans where everything points to an abduction. So we have to investigate that abduction. We have to investigate the, the dumping of, of his corpse. And so there's all kinds of charges that can go along with that. And they worked. I'll tell you what, Captain, I give big ups to the Boardman Police Department. They worked that David Evans case very, very hard. They put a lot of effort into that David Evans case, and they worked it for many years after his murder. 
and where we have seen some departments say, well, the coroner says this was natural cause death. Looks like there's nothing for us to investigate here, or we have other cases that we have to move on to. Boardman still made David Evans' case a priority, even after that coroner's report. Now, one thing that we do need to discuss here today, and one thing that we said we were going to get to last week, and then boom, quickly, two episodes turn into three and then four, because we have theories to discuss. We have suspects to discuss that we weren't able to get to. But the first thing we need to discuss the possibility that all three of these cases are connected. There has been a lot of debate over that over the years and over the decades in Boardman, Ohio. We sit here and we're able to retroactively look back on these cases. And of course, we know a lot more today in some of these cases than we knew back in 1975. And so we're able to apply some of that information that had leaked out or made its way to the newspapers over the years and then apply that to what we knew back then. And these cases, I'm not going to lie to you, Captain, it's very difficult for me to sit here and give a strong opinion on if these cases are, in fact, connected or not. If I had to guess, I would probably say no, that we have three separate homicide cases here, that somebody else is responsible for each one of these. And we have some information that may back up that opinion. Well, probably the best thing to do is go through each case one by one. Yeah, so we can compare how they are similar, but also maybe the differences. And I think the greatest difference that we see here is probably the first case compared to the second and third. And that being the case of 15-year-old Thomas Baird. So with Thomas's case, what the police were able to tell us well after his investigation was hot and heavy. But at some point, the police start to tell us their theory based off of information that they have collected in his case. So his case, the general story has always been that he was found by someone or found by a police officer. He's kind of slumped over. He's been beat badly. I mean, he's got a lot of head injuries when he is found. And unfortunately, he's unconscious, right? So they have to take him directly to the hospital where immediately he's put into intensive care. He, strong kid, survives for several days. I actually believe it was like 10 days, maybe up to two weeks. But he survives quite a long time. But unfortunately, he never regains consciousness. So the police, they put this boy in the hospital in intensive care, but they are not able to ask him any questions about who attacked you, what happened to you. And so they have to speak with his parents, his family, his friends. And the general story that comes out at some point with the Thomas Baird case is that he was jumped by a group of teenagers. And I'm sure, you know, Captain and I have spoke to a couple different people on all three of these cases. The persons that I spoke to, what I was told, Captain, and I'll let you chime in and you tell me if you heard any different or any other variation But the general description that I have put together from several accounts was that there was some kind of fight that broke out at a local skating rink. And Thomas is there, 15-year-old boy. Of course, that's where you're going to be, having a good time at the skating rink. He's there amongst his peers. And from my understanding, there's some kind of fight or argument that breaks out at the skating rink or just outside of the skating rink to which management or whomever shoo the kids away send them off hey get out of here we don't want any trouble we're not going to have any trouble you guys in here causing all kinds of mischief and whatnot get out of here and somewhere along the line when he is walking home it has always been believed that whoever he had a beef with or whoever didn't like him for whatever reason maybe That person and or a group of people caught up to Thomas at some point where another fight breaks out. And unfortunately, this is the result that we have. One of the best things about being part of True Crime Garage is when we cover these cases, especially when we're doing a a multi-part series, is to be able to be contacted by local people that know more about the case, maybe know more about rumors. And I was also lucky enough to talk to multiple local sources and to talk to 
I don't want to call him a web sleuther because he is local to the area, Tom Kerrigan. I kind of disagree with you of where would you be when you're 15. Skating rink is, you're kind of done with the skating rink by age 15. But the the local rumor was that there was there wasn't a scuffle between Thomas and, and multiple kids, but one kid. And the rumor was always that this kid was about 18, which if 15 is kind of on the older end of somebody that would be at the skating rink, 18 is definitely older. So I don't know if that individual worked there or had some connection to the skating rink. But like you said, same type of rumor. Well, then Thomas goes walking home and this individual tracks him down. So it then becomes, was it was he beat up by a group of people or was it just one individual? Yes, exactly. And that's exactly very similar to the rumor that I had always heard, that it was either one person or some other people caught up with him based off of whatever went down at the skating rink right. uh, shortly before that. And so the reports I found was he was found about 10 p.m., so well after dark, I don't know what time they were all shooed away or whatever uh, the the skating rink let out that night. But um, yeah, the reports I have show that he was found about 10 p.m. that night. Think about that scenario. Now, going forward, we covered the Bellino case and the Evans case really well and pretty thorough, as much as you can cover in about an hour or two for those two cases last week. And let's do a little comparison of what we've just said with the Baird case and cross-check that with Bellino and Evans. I think what everybody is going to immediately notice is a very huge discrepancy between MO in the Baird case compared to Bellino and Evans. What I see with Bellino is a case where he very likely may have willingly got into the wrong person's vehicle or he was snatched on the side of the road as he's walking home from his best friend, Don Templeman's house. And then you go a few years later to the David Evans case. To me, that screams abduction because we have his father, we have his coach, we have the teachers at school, we have his friends, kids that knew him, that are saying, no, this kid would not have gotten into anyone's car willingly, especially a stranger. So much so to the point saying that they would be shocked if he would even be willing to walk up to the driver's side window to offer directions or help or anything like that. And then we also have to factor in, too, he's actually, the Evans family was actually from New York and had moved to Boardman, Ohio, I believe about two years, maybe two and a half years before David Evans' death. And so we talk about, hey, can you offer me directions? This is a younger kid, 13. He probably may not know or be able to give too much in the way of directions. The other thing, too, that I think we always need to remind our small children of is that adults do not need help from small children. And I know David was a little older. He was 13. But again, we have a situation where everybody is telling us, everybody says, no, this kid, he was standoffish. He was more likely to sit back and assess the situation. He wasn't a go-getter. He wasn't a risk taker. He would have likely not have gotten into anyone's vehicle. And then compound that with the idea that, well, his mother at 1130 PM that night, remember his father saw him around 630 that night as he was leaving to go to his night class at Youngstown State. We have the mother who is then out on foot searching for her son. And after he's reported missing to the police, she then quickly finds his hat that he was wearing trampled in the snow near the same intersection where his father last seen him. So we have a situation here where it looks to me like David Evans was snatched off of the street and probably fairly quickly after he was last seen by his father talking to his father that night. Now, again, 630 January in Ohio, it's going to be dark or getting dark around that time. So I see a situation here. Could they all be connected? There's a possibility, right? There's always a possibility until they are solved. But here we have a situation where it looks like there is a perpetrator or perpetrators of 
the Bard case, I'm sorry, of the Baird case, and they were probably a person or persons closer to Thomas's age, and it was about something completely different. With Bellino's case, whether he gets into a vehicle willingly or if he's abducted, it doesn't matter. We know the way that he's found in that dumpster with the belt still wrapped around his neck and pulled tightly. His, I mean, his trousers are down around his ankles when he's found. That's a very much different MO in death and very much committed by a different person than the Baird case. Right, and and just looking at the Baird case initially, he's not found in an area that somebody was trying to conceal the body. No. And and the other two cases were. So initially when we looked at this, I I went, okay, it looks like uh, Thomas was jumped on the way home probably to do with some kind of altercation at the skating rink, or there was just groups of older kids that would, you know, drive around and, and sometimes have altercations so it could have everything to do with the confrontation at the skating rink or it could be simply some older kids saw him uh driving home and or walking home and and decided to rough him up and it and it got out of hand so initially i thought well the thomas case is separate from the two and it seems like in brad's case and in david's case they were both abducted and 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 possibly in another location for a time period before their bodies were uh, dumped. Yes, because it's several days before either boy is recovered. Either of their bodies are recovered in that situation. And as we said with Baird, he's located there that night. And as you pointed out, no one's attempting to conceal his body. In fact, probably his killer or killers believe that he would survive that attack when they left him there that night now let's take this a step further okay so baird looks completely different than the other two bellino's case looks to me like a sadistic child rapist killer kind of situation for bellino david evans is really complicated because while i firmly believe that he was abducted and it sounds like a lot of the guys working law enforcement, a lot of the men and women working in law enforcement and boardmen at the time firmly believe that as well. His case is very difficult because he's not sexually assaulted like Bellino was. He dies from his diabetes from not getting his insulin shot. And it's really difficult to sit here and say what would have happened had he not had the diabetes, right? Because we can't sit here and go, well, It would have been exactly like Brad Bellino's case. He would have been choked and killed and then dumped somewhere. We can't say that. We don't know that. There's a chance that his abductor, for whatever reason, abducted him and planned on releasing him at some point. Never planned or never wanted to kill the kid. And so there it gets very difficult to say if the Bellino and the Evans case is connected or, in fact, how similar they just may be. Yeah, my issue with the Bellino case is yeah, he's found in this dumpster. He definitely was strangled. But there's no other bruising really on his body, which is normally if somebody's, you know, beaten and tortured and then choked to death, you're going to see a lot of bruising. Right. And I don't think that he was tortured there. I mean, well, let's not get into a debate of what torture is. I mean, obviously his... And this is hard to say his last minutes on this planet were not good ones at all. Um, But with David Evans, we see he has injuries to suggest that there may have been some kind of scuffle that he was in. And I think that maybe that took place trying to get him into a vehicle. We have some other injuries to David Evans, but we know that some of those occurred after his actual death. And I believe that the broken wrist and the the hole that was found in his back, those were made by happenstance, by somebody moving, trying to move and conceal his body after he already had passed. Yeah, and so like you're saying with, with Evans's case, look, you have bruising because you, abdu- you abducted the kid. 
There's bruising because there was some kind of fight. There was bruising because there was some kind of abuse. And then he dies. So it doesn't matter that he died because he needed his insulin. You're the reason that he's dead. You are now a murderer. Correct. Correct. It To me, denying somebody their, their life-saving medicine is the same as denying them air, right? Especially when we're talking about children here. So my opinion is, Captain, that these three are probably not connected. If we do have any connection, it's probably between the Bellino case and the David Evans case. Now, going back to the opinion of the letter writer that we referenced in this week's trailer, the person that says, to whom it may concern, please don't let that man out of jail in Struthers, as he is the one responsible for three boys' deaths, the one that was found along a street. That could describe Thomas Baird, the one that was found along a street. Right. Could describe Thomas Baird. The unfortunate thing for us reviewing this letter is we're not certain that that's who the writer was actually talking about or referencing. The letter goes on to say the Bellino boy and Evans boy. So that's pretty clear that 11 year old girl would have been dead by now. If he had gotten away with it, Mr. As you know, one makes just one wrong move and gets caught. These kind of men must be kept out of circulation. Now I cannot tell you who I am as I want to keep on living. Someone would kill me, but if he is found guilty, I will talk to someone and I will tell you how I know it may even come as a shock and I know you won't want to believe me again. It's an anonymous letter signed. Please help save the children. You know, I know in the Bellino case and in the Evans case, there were a lot of people in the community trying to get involved in these cases and trying to help. They were phoning in possible tips, anything that they thought was weird, anything they thought they saw, may have heard rumors that they had heard. A lot of times they were phoning in, hey, this dude, he's strange. Why don't you go look at him? Like with no other information other than this guy's a weirdo, I would take a look at him. Based off of this information, what we're able to find here, and I'm not going to disclose anybody's name, but the 11 year old girl would have been dead by now if he had gotten away with it. Okay. So what we know happened here in this case is that the Struthers police department, they did have somebody locked up for the, what they have listed as the subject tried to attack an 11 year old girl in Struthers, Ohio. And the individual that they locked up was a Caucasian male from Struthers, Ohio, age. He was like 25 going on 26 at the time, driving a white or cream colored 1966 Buick. Interesting thing here, Captain, was the damaged trunk of his vehicle. The police noted that it will not close. And we'll continue to look into this individual and see what came of this attack on the 11 year old. But for now... I don't know that this anonymous letter directly links this guy to one, if not any of the murders, because again, reviewing this letter that was sent, we don't know who sent it, what information they were basing their findings off of. And then on top of that, if in fact they are referencing the Thomas Baird case as one of the three being connected, well, we have information that suggests otherwise, that the Baird case isn't connected to the other two whether the other two are connected or not. And so there on its face, it doesn't seem to hold a lot of value, this letter or this information, if you know that these cases are in fact not connected. Sounds like to me a a local guy that maybe heard some rumors or maybe is just speculating on his own. But again, the letter gives no evidence to prove that these three murders were connected. Cheers, mates. 
tall cans in the air. Hopefully it's warming up where you are. Here it's raining and cold. <laughs> Why we choose to live in Columbus to this day, I will never know. Hey, well, hey I, one day we, we might move. We'll have to move together. I love Columbus. I love it very much. But uh, yes, the, the weather is a pisser sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about as polite as I can be about it this this week as it's rained every single day, it feels like. Now, Captain, we tend to be our biggest critics, right? I don't know that everybody out there in listener land will agree with that, but we know who we are. I know who you are. We're fools. You're trying to figure out who I am. Uh, tall cans in the air. But um, we are fools. Captain is right. Uh, I'm fool number one, and he is working to get to be Fool number two. I'm, I'm actually fool number three. There's. I know. There's a weird guy in the middle. Car- Carlos. Uh, Carlos. And he won't show up. We can't get him yeah, to get back to the quit. garage. There's a go. He's number two. Yeah. Um, but one of these, one of the things that I face with our little garage show here is, you know, we spend all week pouring through the information, tearing through whatever we can find and get our hands on, get our ears on, get the eyeballs working on. And then we have to sit down in the garage together and hit the record button. And then once we hit stop, well, it's usually uh, a drive home. And on the drive home, it's often it's going, hey, that was really good. I'm excited about this case. I was excited about it when we went into it. I loved the research process. I loved delivering it to the listeners, packaging it up and sending it out to the world. Then there's other times where you go, you know, I'm disappointed in myself. I thought I would have been better. I thought that uh, I went into this today, into the recording, thinking that it would be better. And in all reality, my thoughts and opinions on how we did, they don't mean squat. It only matters what the listeners think. And I often find that sometimes my opinion of the show may be different than theirs. And sometimes it's, they, they have much better feelings about the package that we put out and sent out to the world. And then there's other times I think, man, we nailed it. That was a really good true crime podcast. And then I'm, I'm quickly deflated uh, when told otherwise. But last week when we did the Boardman case, we didn't know going into it that it would expand to additional episodes. No, we got so wrapped up in discussing some of the contradictions in some of the information. And again, when you have three cases, there's a lot to talk about. And so it quickly went from two episodes to what will be three and four. One way that I kind of judge on how we did, because I, you know, I don't have a hundred listeners standing there going, great job, Nick. Great job, Colonel. Please come back next week. No, we don't, we don't have that. But what we do have is our blog on truecrimegarage.com. And usually I feel like we've done a great job when I see, boom, there's a bunch of people going to the blog and they're either asking questions or they're putting out some other information maybe that they have found on these same cases. Or they're criticizing our pronunciation. And my face. Yes. Uh, It comes under under question a lot. (laughs) I'm wearing a mask today. But Mm. um, so I wanted to take this opportunity because we don't do a four-part series every week and here we had a lot of good information and even better questions that were put on the blog and at some point i'm reviewing them and i'm like all right i'll answer this i'll answer that and then i thought you know i can answer them right here in the garage because a lot of these require a discussion and not just a one sentence answer so i'm going to read a couple of our questions from our blog all right let's get into it all right i'm gonna i'm gonna leave everybody anonymous but if you want to find out who wrote these you can simply go to our website and you'll see the person's name or the name that they came up with when they typed in that question captain flugerville here's the first one according to the autopsy brad's last meal was chicken and pineapple which is what he ate at the templeman's on friday at 7 30 p.m it takes somewhere between two to four hours for digestion to empty the stomach That makes me wonder where the Saturday at 9 p.m. time of death came from. And then I'm going to take this one step further here, Captain, before we give an answer uh, and some more information here. Because another person posted a very similar question. This is exactly what I was thinking. He was killed on the night he went missing. 
If he were killed a whole day later, then the autopsy would have difficulty determining his last meal. It would be digested. I think our narrator made a mistake. Okay. Clearly, it couldn't be talking about me making a mistake. mistake. Yeah, it's probably me. Did somebody say steak? Um, no, th- this is both of these are very good questions, and I'm glad that somebody pointed out maybe the narrator made a mistake. Sometimes things get lost in translation, right? And we find that that happens a lot with with our shows. We're delivering information to you. Sometimes your brain is not so busy, but your hands are busy, or you're doing other things. We know a lot of people like to listen at work or on their commute. And so you're not able to really dial in at 100%. Sometimes it's about 95, 96, and our listeners are very smart. So let's address this meal against the idea that he was killed the next day. So where this information comes from is actually two different sources. First, we have the autopsy report. Now, unfortunately, the information I have, the coroner's post-mortem report, is only four pages long. Now, depending on jurisdiction, depending on what county you are in, I don't know whether to say that that's a short report or a long report because, Captain, we've been doing this a long time. Depending on what county, if we can get an autopsy report, it's all over the shop. Sometimes you're getting a report. I've seen them as short as two pages. I've seen them as long as 29 or 30 pages. And it doesn't always make any rhyme or reason why some are doing much longer reports than others. There's there There's not always... It's not like in one case we only have two pages of information to report and in others we have 29. No, it's it's similar. It's just how they conduct their paperwork. So this one's only four pages long. Now, there's always been a little bit of a question of a toxicology report in the Bellino case. And Captain, you brought up the idea of, well, Bellino, while it appears to be like a sadistic murder where he was choked with this belt and we know he was sexually assaulted, he doesn't really have any other bruising or, or much in the way of defensive wounds on his person. I bring up the toxicology report because there has been some question, you know, maybe he was sedated somehow. Maybe he he took something or ingested something that somebody gave him and he wasn't in a state of fighting back. Also, without going into any detail at all, because I'm not going to dance in the sickness too long. Based off of how he's found, you can also make some assumptions he was not in a position to be defending himself greatly at the time, unfortunately. Now, the information I have is that the time of death was approximately 9 p.m. Saturday, April 1st, 1972. So this would be a full 24 hours after he was last seen by Don Templeman when he left Don's house on foot. And we can assume that he was... a attacked or abducted by 9 p.m. that Friday night because he never makes it home. Now, the information about the last meal, the meal that was found in him, the chicken and pineapple, that information actually does not come from the coroner. That information was from an interview that one of the detectives did years later. And the detective is referencing that, oh, we don't believe any of the sightings of Brad the unconfirmed sightings of Brad on that Saturday because we have information that says that his last meal was the meal that he consumed that Friday. So we have a difference of opinion here between the coroner who's saying in their paperwork, time of death, 9 p.m. on Saturday, to what the detective is saying later in an interview that the last meal was what he ate at the Templeman's, which probably was not at 730 because we know that the mom was out and the dad was sick in bed. But regardless, it's interesting. We got listeners saying, look, it would have taken somewhere between two to four hours for digestion to empty the stomach. Makes me question the coroner's finding of the Saturday 9 p.m. time of death. I agree with the listeners here. It makes me question it, too, if, in fact, the chicken and pineapple is true, because I don't have that in, in my paperwork. I've not seen it in writing anywhere. I can also assume one thing, though, too, Captain, that there's probably some additional pages of this autopsy report. Maybe not this exact same report. Maybe there was the toxicology later along with some of other information. Maybe that information that the detective is referencing is from that report. I've not seen it. So all I can tell you is what the coroner's saying and then what the detective is later saying. So they are 
two different sources and they seem to have somewhat of a difference of opinion. Now, the reason why we made sure to include that is that it was intriguing because there were several people that said that they saw Brad Bellino on that Saturday. Yeah. And now we look back and we're getting other information that probably suggests that, no, they were just trying to be helpful citizens. They probably saw a boy that looked similar to Brad Bellino. They wanted to help. They're trying to provide information. Unfortunately, this boy was either being held captive at that time or, as statistics would tell us, might already be dead. Right. Especially when we have a stranger on stranger abduction and it being a youth that's abducted. If he was abducted. Correct. That we have a situation where he was, you know, oftentimes the, t- the statistics will say that they're only alive for a short period of time after the abduction takes place. Based on the way that he's found, again, he may have gotten into a vehicle willingly or he may have been snatched off the street based off of the sexual assault, the way that the murder took place, the belt, the way that he's dumped at some point, whether he got in that vehicle willingly or not, at some point he's abducted. It's one of those cases where both, uh, both can't scientifically be true, but you also wonder what are the added factors and the added hurdles that come with finding the body, not until April 4th, when we know that he was, Uh, last seen on May 31st. I think any time that the body is found uh, a significant amount of time afterwards, it makes the coroner's job more difficult. I also think that we should implement a a system that I've been trying to get passed through the the House and the the Senate. Uh, I created a machine to test how FAMI you're feeling. And so is this coroner just making a mistake? Because, again, the coroner's human. He could just be making a mistake. Maybe he meant Friday at 9 p.m. This one is very human. I think he actually got into some trouble years later. I think it was some some minor trouble, but uh, I don't think he was fully on the up and up 100% of the time. When I que- Again, I question this report because of the 9 p.m., because the 9 p.m. death makes sense on when he left, when, uh, when Bradley left, and when he would... Possibly if he was abducted, I I don't even know if he's abducted. We have no eyewitnesses that say he was abducted from some white van, hashtag ban the van, or that he got into some car. The sources that I was talking to in the last week, and that's another thing that I love about doing a a four-parter or a multi-parter, is the time period in between the shows that we, we don't have just seven days to come up with as much information and talk to as many people as we can. We have double that length. A lot of people said in that area, in that neighborhood, there was a clubhouse slash treehouse slash fort, whatever you want to call it, that was known to where kids would go experiment with things sexually, possibly smoke some weed, smoke some cigarettes, maybe drink some booze. And there's a lot of locals that believe you know based on his injuries and even some you know ex-law enforcement that have said when you consider all the evidence and consider that the location on which he would be walking home would put him in the vicinity of this treehouse is it possible that he stopped by there to see what was going on We've seen this in other cases where older teens or older men will pay for sexual favors. And so there's a lot of a lot of people locally and, and like I said, ex-law enforcement that that lean towards the idea that this was, um, you know, a sexual act that became an accident, an accidental death. Now, my problem with the way they worded it to me and the way I heard it was that this was, that was consensual. And like we said, Bellino is 12 years old. You can't consent to this. This was, this was a rape and this was a murder, but, but I think, like I said, it possibly was a accidental murder. It's an interesting angle. Again, it's always been reported that it was a sexual assault, which is obviously very different than than that and again 
the a lot of these are it's you know speculation it's conjecture it's things that we will not know until the person responsible is found right well, well my other problem with the coroner report is we have this strangulation with this belt and then they're claiming that there's no other bruising on the body we just have to take their word for that to me those rumors and the fact that there is no bruising on his body other than this strangulation points to that rumor makes sense to me but again i don't know how accurate that this coroner report is and again i'm going to give him the benefit of doubt and because of the time period that elapsed maybe his information is just a little wrong and his science is a little bit wrong again early 70s well and the the other fact too is we have four pages of a report they're very well could they're not numbered you know this is four of seven or this is four of four we have four pages of a report. There may be additional information that right. we just are not privy to. All right, here's another question here, Captain. Great episode again, guys. We'd love to hear that. I was wondering the same thing as the person above about Brad's time of death. Also, what was the deal with Brad's brother phoning the Templemans after 10 p.m. on Friday? This was after Don was in bed and then the Templemans driving Brad's route to try to find him. Did both households just give up and go to bed after that? I'm sorry if I missed something. Please do not apologize. We merci for listening, as we like to say. But um, no, so this is actually part of the conflict, right? We have Don Templeman, Brad Bellino's best friend, says, I kind of remember it differently, right? The Bellino family is saying, due to circumstances, our busy household, mom is out of town working, dad stayed out kind of partying the night before and slept in late and either dad wakes up according to the according to the Bellino coroner's report, dad wakes up, discovers that Brad is not home. It's news to him and then he tries to find and locate his son, eventually calling the police and filing a, a missing persons report. That taking place on Saturday. Don Templeman his best friend in an interview that took place decades after the homicide says, no, I remember it differently. I believe I was in bed. I'd already gone to sleep. I think I went to bed around 10 PM at some point, Brad's brother calls and says, Hey, you know, Brad never came home to which I believe it was Don's mom answered the phone for that call, according to Don's story. And he says that, Either him and his father, I'm guessing him and his mother, because the father was sick in bed. They go out and they drive the route. They don't see anything unusual. They come back. This is one of those difficult things that it's tough to say. I want to believe Don. I, I believe that Don believes what he is telling us. I don't believe that he's giving us a lie or anything like that. I, I think that he lost a part of himself when he lost his best friend all those years ago. And it may be a situation where he's misremembering. Yeah, or both stories are true. You could you could have a situation where, you know, Brad's brother calls because he's concerned. Hey, you know, my parents told me my brother's supposed to be home. He's not home. I'll just give a call real quick. Hey, has my brother left? Oh, he already left. Okay, well, maybe he'll turn up. And because he's the older brother, he just goes about his business, doesn't doesn't check in again. And it's not until the morning where the dad's going, wait a second, did he just never come home? Right. And it's, it's, I think the part in the question that we have to really kind of clarify is it sounds to me though, based off of all, all the information we've seen here, captain, that yes, you might be right. It could both be true. There's, there's a chance of that. The Templemans could have went out and briefly looked for Brad that night, didn't find him, return home and go to bed for whatever reason. But it's always been the Bellino family story that they were either not aware that Brad was missing until the following day or they didn't actively search for him. Yeah, but maybe Brad's brother never told his parents. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that it's We're basing this off of everything that we've seen. The Bellinos are saying we were not aware that our son was missing until sometime before noon on Saturday. Right. And again, you're right. The brother could have called. But mom and dad didn't know that he was missing until that Saturday. That's something, again, we just will not know. We will not know what is the actual truth. And in 
looking back on it, it might not really matter. But if you're going to call into question and be skeptical of the people closest to the victim, then it then it probably does matter quite a bit. Next question here, Captain, we have is, my parents were good friends of Brad Bellino's parents. Sadly, both have passed away before ever seeing their son's case solved. They lost touch during the 80s and didn't see each other as often. Also, I heard he, meaning Brad, was on his bike when he went missing. I don't recall if it was recovered. I was too young to remember or know very much, but the facts I've shared, I believe, to be true. And the writer goes on to say, last Applewood Acres is around two to three miles from behind Boardman Plaza, where Brad was found. The perpetrators would need a vehicle for sure. Yes. So uh, we, we had said that, too, that we believe that there's a vehicle involved in this situation. We believe that it would be an additional crime scene to what we already discussed because of the distance between of, again, we don't know where he was taken from or where he got into a vehicle or where he went uh, between leaving Don's and the time that he is killed. But as far as the bicycle goes, I had heard that rumor too. Okay. I had heard that rumor too, but I'd never seen it in print. And why is that important? Because we have very quickly what we said was a scary fact in the case that after Brad Bellino's body is found, his parents come out immediately to the newspapers and to the police. And they're saying, you know, our son unfortunately had hitchhiked in the past and we warned him about getting into vehicles, especially with strange people. We told him not to hitchhike. And then we have Don Templeman, his best friend who says, yes, all of us kids hitchhiked back then he said myself included he said but brad seemed to do it more often than other kids our age and so now let's go back and go okay well was there a bike because that is a key piece of information in my my opinion because if there was a bike there would a couple things would have to happen one i think he would be less likely to hitchhike right he's got a bike to deal with right two if he did hitchhike or he was abducted, well, where's the bike? And we know his parents, regardless of what story we believe, maybe they're both true, people were out searching for him before the police were called. The police never mention a bike. They never mention finding a bike, not being able to find a bike. His parents never mention a bike. And furthermore, they also tell the paper, not just was he known to hitchhike, but when he arrived at Don Templeman's house, and this is based off of the Templeman's information and Brad, Bellin Brad Bellino's family's information, they say that he arrived at the Templeman house around 1230 that Friday to hang out with his buddy. And they specifically say in that article that he either walked or hitchhiked to get to the Templeman's. Right. Then we know that they hang out, they play basketball, they're up in the attic for a while, they're having a good time, and at some point, Brad Bellino has to go home. And so unless he had a bike there with him previously from another hangout session. Yeah, or or he borrowed Don's, which for the last 20-some years, Don has never mentioned that his friend borrowed a bike. Correct. So while we've heard that same rumor, and it's an interesting one to ponder, and it was one that I really tried to get to the bottom of, the best we can say is that the Templemans and Bellinos, based off of what they said to the papers and to the police at the time, they give all indication that Brad arrived at the Templemans that day before he went missing later that night on foot. And if anybody wants to go back and reference what we were just talking about with the hitchhiking, you can find that information in the Youngstown Vindicator. It was an article from April 5th, 1972. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Make sure you join us back here for part four. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen.